When you hear the word apologetics, what comes to mind? A lot of times these big names that you hear from ages gone by, and many of you were impacted by a little apologetics book called More Than a Carpenter. Mm. And another one that came along after it called Evidence That Demands a Verdict by a gentleman named Josh McDowell. I am sitting with a cutting edge, new generation, <laughs> apologetics guy. He just had a whole crowd clapping in there. We're in Florida and I caught up with Sean McDowell. People hear that name, McDowell, Sean, and instantly you are a labeled man. How, how does it feel to be a son of the pioneer? <laughs> You know what? He really is a pioneer. When I think about words that capture him, he was a trailblazer. He was doing it when quite literally nobody was Mm -hmm. doing it. It's humbling. The older I get, the more I meet people, professors and other apologists and writers who will just say, your dad influenced me. And that Mm -hmm. book, More Than a Carpenter, Evidence Demands a Verdict. So honestly, like I told my wife recently, I said, "I I don't even know how much just any success I've had I could take away from being a McDowell. I don't even know how to separate those things. He's given an incredible reputation, incredible work. And if I can carry it on in my own generation, you know, to God be the glory. Amen. Well, I'm little Stu and and I'll never, ever (laughs) live down that big Stu was such a godly man and he's in heaven but i just love hanging out with guys like you because you we get each other you know it's like it's 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 awkward and and we don't mind the comments some funny some good some not meant to be you know negative but can be taken however but you have continued in the legacy of apologetics and i want to ask you a question i want to ask you a bridge question okay There, there are so many people that grew up with your dad's books and now here you are in this new age today. Here, here you are in COVID, post-COVID. Here you are dealing with, you know, we used to think millennials were the thing, right? But now we have Z generation, X generation, and all these other nuances, and then we have gender issues and all that. How is it different right now besides the fact that people will listen to this interview on traditional AM radio, but also a bunch of people will listen on their smartphone, which means their smartphone got smarter because they have the Truth app, right? But how is it different now than when your dad was grinding out and you were just a little tiny guy running around? So I actually, when I helped my dad update his book, Evidence That Demands Verdict in 2017, I asked him that question. And one of the things he said is when he started, I mean, I think it must be late 60s, probably 70s and 80s, on the, the free speech platform, and on college campuses, he said there was an assumption that we're, there was such a thing as truth. We can and should discover it. Also, the assumption was that the problem is somewhere out there in the world that we can fix. Mm. Now it's shifted from objective to subjective, from external to wow. internal. And so people think the problem as they look inside themselves Which in some ways you could say, well, that's a biblical turn because we think the problem is sin internally. And of course, that's not exactly how people diagnose it. But you see the shift in truth in terms of if I feel something, if I want something, if I desire something, who people say, well, that's true for me. So I think there's been an entire epistemological shift about the knowability of truth, about the value of truth, about the discoverability of truth. And whether we should even try to seek it or not. So that's probably the big shift. I think the other thing is just emotionally, we've had a massive increase in mental health and other mental illnesses. And when people aren't healthy, and a lot of this is, I think, can be tied to social media, that affects how they process truth. That affects it deeply. So I think in some, I guess I would say three things. I would say there's a shift from objective to subjective. There's mental health concerns. And now there's an increasing with artificial intelligence, I think, a despair among some people about whether we can really decipher truth from fiction, fact from reality. If you think we've had fake news in the past, you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah, just because they say it on the news that this person said this person, then everyone's like, well, it must be true. But it could be the farthest thing from the truth. So there's all these voices and noises. And how do you decipher truth out of that blur, that big old fog, which you're talking about tonight, I think. Isn't that your message tonight? And for those of you who don't know, we'll bring you into the situation. We're actually in a cool little green room, which has got some good little food in here. And we're about to go hear Tim Tebow speak. Let's go. And this is Kingdom Come. This is a huge conference at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, Truths That Transform. Dr. Rob Pacienza, one of our great Truth Network pastors, who is like the successor of the great, late D. James Kennedy, 
who I know he and your dad had some good times together, and he and my dad had some good times together. But talk about the, how important that is and how you're speaking tonight. Because, you know, it used to be just, quote, John 14, 6, and just, you know, mic drop, you're out the door. But there's a way to articulate that. How are you going to embolden and encourage people tonight on the line of truth and what is truth? So it's interesting you say people could just quote John 14, 6, or the guy would show up at sports games, you know, the John three sixteen guy. Now I think if that guy showed up, people would be like, what is John? What is, like, there's no biblical literacy that there used to be, and there's certainly not the biblical authority that there used mm. to be. That's really the root of the issue. Now, lurking behind that is even the idea, is there such a thing as truth? Can we know truth? Why is truth important? And the good news is because people are made in the image of God, we know that truth matters. We know that we should seek it. But it's like we're just, uh, the illustration I use like a beach ball. If you take a beach ball and you push it underwater, it's going to pop up because of its very nature of gravity, et cetera. Well, our culture is pushing down certain things about the nature and knowability and importance of truth. And all I'm going to do tonight is give people confidence to say there are certain things that you know with confidence and speak them and lean into them. Don't be talked out of things we know are true because of our increasing secular culture that says things like live your truth and that might be true for you, but not true for me. Sean McDowell, he's authored and co-authored more than 20 books on apologetics, intelligent design, ethics, youth ministry. He holds a PhD in apologetics and worldview studies from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. You live out in Southern California, that's crazy. And But I'm gonna tell you, you're going to talk to people tonight, and it's interesting that rewind to the 60s, the sexual revolution, all this stuff going on, fast forward to the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, now it's in the 2020s, and has that much changed really in terms of the heart of man being deceitful, desperately wicked, who can know it, needing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Sean, talk about how the the, the old is still real. The, the old news is not bad news. It's still the good news. Mm. You know, in our age of what's called intersectionality, which divides people up based on their skin color, their sex, mm -hmm. their sexual orientation, whether you're able-bodied or not, uh, we tend to think, I can't understand somebody who has different intersectional qualifications than myself. That's what's pushed. What's missed in that is that we share far more in common across any of those differences because of our shared humanity than differences. I mean, I've got an atheist friend who we're talking about writing a book together down, down the road, and we have far more in common when we just talk about the kind of dad we want to be, the kind of worker we want to be, the kind of spouse we want to be, loving our parents, but we miss that in our culture. We push so many differences. So the heart of man doesn't change. And it never will change. In every generation, we're looking for something to satisfy the human heart. And it's just something new, but it ultimately fails. So the gospel is as relevant, as fresh mm. as it ever has been. We just have to find creative, thoughtful ways of speaking it today that meets people where they are at. We're going to come back with a few more minutes with Sean McDowell. And we're going to run in and, and see Tim Tebow. But here's what's, what we're going to do when we come back. We're going to ask the question, who is Sean McDowell? How did you make the turn from, how did you discover Jesus was more than a carpenter? We're going to find that out from you, okay? And, you know, you grew up in it, but when did it, when did it start growing up in you? Mm. And we're going to answer the question that's lurking out there. What do I say to my atheist friends? What do I say to those hardest, the cults, those hardest to reach with the good news of Christ? Sean, we're going to go to a break, but first tell everyone your website you're all over social media, man. You got followers on Instagram. You got followers on Twitter, StuTube, all those things. But tell us your website real quick so folks can find you. SeanMcDowell.org would probably be the hub that links to my YouTube channel, Instagram. Uh, I'm, I have a blog that's there, links to my speaking calendar. I even use, even though I, I know it's debatable, I post content on TikTok just because that's where this younger generation is at. But the hub to get it out would be SeanMcDowell.org. I'm about to follow him on all those channels. I encourage you to, ha you need to play this guy and make sure your kids are following him on all their grams and on all their socials and have him come speak at your church or your conference. We're at a conference in Florida right now. He's lighting it up tonight speaking. We're excited about that. We're gonna come right back and get to know this guy a little bit more in just a second. Hang on, more Truth Talk coming up right after this. Truth Talk. 
You're listening to The Truth Network and truthnetwork.com. Who is Sean McDowell? An even greater question is this son of a titan, a Christian apologist, a legend who has gone on college campuses and witnessed atheists and led all kinds of people to the Lord and been on TV and radio all over the world, been on my show. How did he discover that Jesus Christ is more than a carpenter? Talk to me, Sean. Yeah, so I grew up obviously in a Christian home. Always made sense to me. All the arguments that my dad would make hearing him speak, even read some of his books, conversations we'd have. But I was in college in the 90s. I was just searching around on the internet, uh, pre-Google, came across this atheist website, and some of it was dedicated to taking my dad's book chapter by chapter, doctors, historians, lawyers, challenging those ideas. And all I can tell you is it completely caught me off guard. I had that moment of like, wow, here's really smart people that disagree. Interestingly enough, just recently I interviewed one of the atheists who's behind that website. He's a friend of mine now to get the backstory. Really thoughtful guy. But that totally unsettled my faith. That was the first time I thought, oh, I could be wrong about this. So I went to my dad sometime after that, and we were in Breckenridge, Colorado. And I'd said, hey, could we get some coffee? And as best as I can remember, I said, you know, dad, I want to know what's true, but I'm not sure I'm convinced Christianity is really true. And my dad didn't miss a beat. He looked at me, he goes, son, I think that's great. And I remember thinking, like, do you even hear what I said? <laughs> like, you know, sometimes <laughs> I didn't know if he was paying attention. And uh, he goes, I totally heard. And again, as best I can remember, he said something to the effect of, he goes, you know, you can't live on my convictions. You've got to seek after what you think is true. Mm. And if you seek after truth, I'm confident you'll keep believing in Jesus because Jesus is the truth. Yeah. And two other things I remember. He said, don't reject anything you've learned growing up unless you think it's false. Follow truth wherever it leads. Because some kids in Christian homes just want to rebel and be different. And because I had a good relationship with my dad, I had no desire to do that. I just had to know what was true. And then he said, you know, your mom and I will love you no matter what. And in some ways, it feels like such a dramatic story. But in the big picture of my life, it was a pivotal experience where I just thought, I got to find out for myself. Now, I was at Biola at that time. So there were people like J.P. Moreland who was there, one of the great living philosophers. And I would go to his office hours. William Lane Craig was starting to come over shortly after that and teach. So I I had access to these amazing thinkers. And the funny thing is, even though my dad was and is Josh McDowell, I had to hear it from somebody else. (laughs) It's just, that's the way it works. Like you need your Mr. Miyagi or whatever it is. And so... I just started to read, I've read the Quran, I've read the Book of Mormon, I've read atheist texts and just started to realize this makes sense. I think this is true. And also amidst that, really had my own experience of God's grace. It's amazing. A lot of kids, I think, leave because they've never experienced God's grace Mm. deeply in their own life. And I remember, I won't tell you the whole backstory, but I remember a thought going, holy cow, I haven't done any of the big sins and I have absolutely prided myself in ways I didn't realize in being better than other people who did all the big sins we talked about in the 80s and the 90s. And it's like God just pierced my heart. And I think it was a combination of experiencing God's grace, having my questions answered. And that book, More Than a Carpenter, that you mentioned, by the way, we just did an update that'll come out in the fall. It's literally better than ever. And I'm just super excited about it. Great read, a a must read. And also you helped your dad update his apologetics classic, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, a classic. And great to hear your testimony, how it became real to you. So many apologetics just absolute ninjas have come out of your dad's influence. You know, you got Lee Strobel, you got Alex McFarland. We were talking about him earlier, you know, mutual friend. So many that that God has used. Your dad kind of is right there as like the mega Jedi guy, you know, like the Obi-Wan of a lot of these who who set out to disprove the Bible and he he found out he was encountered the resurrected Christ, right? Your dad's testimony is remarkable. It is remarkable. And I'll tell you, when we updated the the evidence demands a verdict, this is 2017. We're already talking with the publisher about a 2029 new update down the road. I've had people reach out to me like people like William Lane Craig, uh, Craig Keener, Craig Blomberg. Mm. I mean, some of these brilliant scholars say your dad's research was pivotal in my life and my ministry. I mean, I heard Greg Kokel, one of the great apologists today. 
He's like, I remember seeing this guy, Josh, when no one else was doing it. He had this calm confidence about him. And so it's just, all I can say is it's humbling. I'm super proud of my dad and uh, just want to carry what he did into the next generation. Yeah, SeanMcDowell.com. You've got social media. You've dot got org. your dot org. sportscaster. Okay, okay watch <laughs> out. Okay, you're going to you're gonna get a play-by-play on the word or play-by-play on the latest game. Either way, go there. And your final word to parents out there who are like your parents, struggling with a kid who's smart, who's looking at everything and being influenced by a culture that's gone awry. Your challenge to parents out there, because you got three of them yourself, three kids, you, you and your wife, Stephanie. What's your word real quick as we wrap up? When I asked my dad years later, what were you really thinking when I had doubts? He goes, I wasn't that worried. I said, why? He said, because we had such a good relationship. My encouragement is to lean in relationally. This is not what you asked for. I understand that it's probably discouraging and it's painful, but more than anything, double down on convincing your child that you love them and you're committed to them for life. It's that softness and that love and relationship that can often soften a heart. Another program powered by the Truth Network.